Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, today we are beginning the fifth session on the Sira, the summer Sira series here at Muslim Space, the Prophet Sallallahu and I. Last time we concluded our session talking about leading up to the Battle of Badr. And we talked about these caravan raids that the Muslim community were carrying out and that these raids were not for the sole sake of plundering or looting or to cause mischief, but uh, these were in effect a form of mobilized resistance um, that we know how the Muslim community was forced out of Mecca, essentially, that they, they, they were left with essentially no other option due to the persecution that had reached such a level that uh, they just had to migrate. They, they had to get out um, there. And we know that, you know, in response to the confiscation of property, the expulsion, the persecution, all these things, the raids were not done with the intent of harming anybody specifically or to specifically kill or target anyone, but to extract goods and resources, many of which were either uh, in uh, recompense for what they had themselves lost, uh, but also just for bare sustenance. Um, so you, you see these raids and caravans being carried out, uh, these caravan raids being carried out, not just for the thrill of it or just because the Muslims were now taking on highway robbery, but uh, because of economic necessity. Uh, we, we know that the Muslims that came into Medina, these were migrants. These were people who were largely merchants and traders, and they struggled in Medina, especially a land of farmers uh, where the monopoly of control was already established with certain factions. And so they had a harder time getting settled. And so this was a way of settling the score with the Meccans who had clearly oppressed them and clearly had taken from them as a way to take back. And so we now transition to, in the aftermath of these raids, we talked about one specific raid, uh, the raid at Nakhla, which caused uh, a bit of an issue because of the fact that it was done in the sacred months that were agreed upon in the sacred months of the uh, pre-Islamic Arabs, as well as the Muslims, um, and how uh, this raid had uh, caused a bit of an uproar for the people, uh, for the Meccans, um, because this was clearly done um, out of, it was, it was not instructed from the process of them that anybody should be killed. It was just a scouting trip, and it turned out to go awry, and people end up being killed, uh, and as well as taken captive and whatnot. <clears throat> But uh, in a sense, uh, this raid did uh, set off a few things. Uh, and as we'll get to today, as we lead into Badr, uh, the Battle of Badr, um, we'll see how not just the, you know, the, the uh, climate had gotten to just a point to where there is going to now inevitably be war between these two communities and these two competing uh, localities and factions. Uh, we see that these raids had given the Muslims a, uh, a better idea of the geography, the topography of the land, uh, the trade routes, the local tribes and settlements that were there. Because again, this is outside of Mecca. This is about 200 miles away from their home. It's a foreign land for the most part uh, because it's not the land they live in every day. So this uh, this way of uh, resistance also helps get them a better sense of rootedness in where they are. So we pick up now in going to the Battle of Badr. <clears throat> we talked about uh, last time we kind of wrapped up on this, but essentially the Prophet ﷺ again, uh, they've uh, established this uh, routine per se, the strategy of raiding caravans strategically uh, for not for any human capital or not for any purpose of killing anybody, but solely for goods and uh, things that will uh, help profit them in a sense to help settle the score, to help balance that which they had lost and to help give them a sense of economic agency. And so the Prophet ﷺ had been notified that there was a very wealthy caravan that is going to be passing by that belonged to one of the uh, very well-known um, leaders of the Quraysh, Abu Sufyan. And so this ca caravan was told to be passing through and it had a very um, significant wealth, uh, significant um, value attributed to it. And so the Prophet ﷺ had in that sense had said, all right, we're going to set out for this caravan because of just how, uh, how wealthy it is and how, how much resource can we can get from that. Uh, and he, uh, in, in, in doing so, uh, then set out with the Muslims. He set out with uh, just over 
300 or so of the Muslims that were there. Uh, we know that there weren't that many of the Muhajirun or the people who migrated from Mecca. There may be just around 100 or a little bit less. Uh, and the rest were the Ansar, the helpers, the people who were local to Medina. And so as the Prophet ﷺ, uh, set out for this caravan, he's headed to uh, intercept this, this wealthy caravan, a few important things are taking place as well. So as he leaves Medina, he leaves behind uh, a few people. He leaves behind his son-in-law, Uthman, who is to become the third uh, Khalifa in, in, in Islam, um, who, is the, who is his son-in-law. Uh, and he, uh, because of the fact that his daughter, the Prophet's daughter, Ruqayya, was ill. So he gave him an exception and said, hey, you know, you stay behind um, because Ruqayya was quite ill. Um, and he also, which is uh, one other thing that was very interesting, is he, uh, in his absence, as he had left and he had given charge to a man uh, to lead the Muslim community in prayers, to, to lead the congregation in prayers while he was gone. The very interesting thing is that this man who he appointed, uh, Abdullah ibn Umm Maktoum, was actually a blind Sahabi. He was a Sahabi who uh, was blind, he was visually impaired, uh, disabled, and uh, it's very significant because this was the same Sahabi who had uh, been referred to as the blind man or the blind person in Surah Abasa. We talked about in an earlier session how the Prophet ﷺ was trying to convince uh, one, of the, one of the elites of the Quraysh, uh, Walid ibn Mughira, uh, to convert to Islam, to you know, spelling out the arguments for Islam and how uh, Abdullah ibn Umm al-Maktoum had come up and had asked to hear more about Islam, had come to him to ask a question and, and whatnot, but essentially had taken away from that interaction and how the Prophet ﷺ turned away from him and frowned. And this was highlighted and sealed in, the, in, in Surah Abasa, uh, this interaction. But we see the, how the Prophet ﷺ had you know, come with this, with this person and lifted them up. This was a person who didn't have much standing, didn't have a lot of tribal influence or significance or lineage or anything like that. He was just someone who uh, was a part of the community, but of no significant stature. And the Prophet ﷺ had honored him, even though the fact that he was uh, differently abled in a sense, uh, the Prophet ﷺ had charged him to be a symbolic leader of the community, uh, even though you know, he may not have been able to see, and even though he was not a person of strong stature or, or someone of strong lineage um, or one of the elites, he was still someone who was elevated. So we see the Prophet ﷺ and his uh, elevation of people on the margins from every single kind of instant and aspect. So we see as he's leaving for battle, as he's leaving, not necessarily, but we're actually clarify, he's not going for battle, he's just going for caravan, but as he's taking uh, a, 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 large, um, uh, a, a large kind of... <clears throat> contingent with him to go to this caravan um, as Medina is being left behind he leaves a person in charge who is uh, who is you know not what you would see as the uh, the typical kind of make of someone who would make a great leader in, in their eyes and so it's very interesting how the process of challenge these norms uh, and it's also interesting that in the sense you and leaving behind his son-in-law as his daughter was ill uh, we see that it's not just a significant for, with, the, with regards to the fact that this was his daughter who was ill, but we see that he's honoring the, this person not just as his son-in-law, but as a husband, but as someone who is uh, as someone who's a husband, who's a caretaker, uh, and not just someone who's an able-bodied person. He can just take them for war or forever, whatever use it might be, but he honors the fact that uh, there are obligations that go beyond uh, what, what the community may need in that instance. And he honors the obligation of a husband to a wife. Uh, and we'll see this play out in other instances as well. But those are just a couple of things there. We also see the Prophet ﷺ as he's marching, as he takes out this contingent and is going towards this caravan, he honors these pre-Islamic traditions of giving uh, banners or flags. You kind of see when uh, in, in, in renditions of armies of past that there are standard bearers. There are people who have the flag. There are people who are the flag bearers. Um, this was also a custom in pre-Islam and it was a very sacred and very 
significant tradition. It was, it was very, um, it, it was very much of an importance thing, uh, a thing of importance that someone is given the flag, that someone is given the flag, but also someone is represented. Uh, certain tribes are represented, certain peoples are represented. So the Prophet had uh, continued this and had given the appropriate flags and banners to certain Sahaba or certain companions of the different tribes that were there. Uh, and so this was, this is very interesting to note. <clears throat> as we go on this discussion that Islam didn't come and just wipe off everything and start from scratch. Islam built upon a foundation that was already there and had annealed some of those things that uh, were completely fragmented, but also had uh, brushed up and polished some of the things that were already there. And so we know the concept of standards and flag bearing and this type of uh, element has continued on, at least continued on for Islamic history for uh, well into the late centuries. And you see uh, that this was something the Prophet did not um, did not take away. The Prophet had honored this. So as uh, Abu Sufyan's caravan is going down towards Mecca, uh, he receives word that the Muslims are setting out a quite heavy contingent that is coming to his caravan. So he's going to maneuver his caravan to a different route so that he avoids being caught. But also he sends word to Mecca that, hey, uh, my we, we've got a big caravan coming here from Syria. Uh, it's got a lot of goods and the Muslims are coming after it. We need backup. So he calls for backup uh, from Mecca and Mecca hearing what is what is about to happen and hearing uh, the plea of Abu Sufyan uh, is absolutely outraged. As you know, you naturally you can assume that, okay, the Muslims like are, have now gotten to this point to where they're trying to get the best of what we have to offer. And so they put together a coalition of about a thousand soldiers. So quite a massive force uh, upon hearing what the, from what they had heard from Abu Sufyan and they now start to march out. Uh, Abu Sufyan's caravan, as I mentioned, takes another route and manages to escape. And he sends a, uh, a, a telegram or of sorts a message that says, hey, I've gotten away from them. No need to come out. Uh, I'll be back in Mecca in a few days time or whatnot. But by this time, the Meccan army had already assembled. They'd already marched out. And so uh, we see that uh, th there is already an, an up in arms that, that is called. And so there is a little bit of a tension. That's a, that's a, uh, a decision to fight that comes about. There's a bit of a tension. There's some consultations. There's all these things that come about uh, within the Meccan army. Some of the uh, some of the Meccans uh, are especially, you know, more uh, more understanding of the Arabic uh, values of tribalism, and so they're like, no, these people are our uh, tribesmen. At the end of the day, we we don't need to fight them. Everything's okay. We don't need to fight. Um, and so, despite this instruction, despite this back and forth, uh, the louder voices in the room pervade. Uh, Abu Jahl, uh, as we had talked about, one of the more uh, and one of the most, the uh, actually the leading uh, opponent of Islam in that time had actually sought to fight in the sense that uh, Islam had been such a thorn in the side of Mecca and the side of the Arabic, uh, of the Arabs uh, traditions, of the Arabs customs, all these different things that this is our opportunity to stamp it out and remove it and we need to do so. Uh, but we see that uh, you know once this voice uh, prevails, um, that this creates a, a bit of an, a bit of a quagmire for say, uh, because this is not just a battle of two different uh, entities or two different cities coming together. The Meccan army and the Medinan army, uh, or the, the Muslims, uh, Muslims contingent, at least their, their army per se, it has members of not just the prophet's tribe, but these are cousins, these are relatives, these are fathers, sons, these are husbands, these are people who are related to one another through so many different uh, different ways, especially because of the fact that so many of them had come from Mecca. So you have so much interconnection in this tribe that it's no longer just two separate, pe two separate groups of people. These are people that are coming together who are, uh, who are, who are tied to, to one another in more ways than one. <clears throat> So the Prophet at this time, um, you know, takes the uh, takes the initiative to uh, make a decision, you know, to 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 give his companions the opportunity for consultation. So we see the Prophet was not just driven by his own agenda or just trying to run the table himself. The Prophet uh, took on consistent uh, times the uh, concept of consultation or shura. So the decision to fight was not one that was just unanimously done in a sense that the process was like, okay, we're going to fight and this is what's going to happen. The process said, let's, let's hear what you have to say. 
um, and uh, consulted and heard uh, out the uh, felt out the convictions of the companions. So there's famous accounts of the companions at this time, both those who had migrated as well as those who were the helpers, giving very impassioned statements about why it was necessary for them to fight and why they were determined to to fight and stand for this cause. And so uh, we we see the process some though in this in this aspect where he has absolutely the prerogative to instruct people as they come, especially as the leader in this, the, the undisputed leader in this case, still exceeding his power and still giving an opportunity for the masses to ha have an input. <clears throat> and we'll see this play out a little bit later on, but we'll see how that goes uh, here. But the Prophet Sam does turn this over and says, uh, is, 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 is open to seeing what people have to say. So the, uh, <clears throat> as I mentioned, <clears throat> the caravan of Abu Sufyan is able to go back to safety, he's able to reach Mecca in due time. And uh, as it comes to the battle, we see that the Prophet arrives at the field or the plains of Badr. Um, and it, again, we see this concept of being advised by the companions continuing to per pervade. It's not just a Prophet decides this and we just roll with everything that he's saying um, and that there's no questions or any opportunity for conversations. Not that the Prophet is not owed that in any way, but that the process of gives space for people to, to uh, consult with him. And so we see the process of gives space for people to consult with him. So when he arrives at the plains of Badr, um, there are these wells, these, these water wells that, that are there. Uh, the process of had uh, makes a decision to uh, to, to camp out at, at some of these wells. And so it's very interesting because one of the companions uh, by the name of Habab ibn al-Mundir, he, he asked the Prophet and he's like, hey, did you camp here because God told you so? Or did you camp here just, you know, because this was your, your own strategic reasoning? And he, uh, the Prophet said, well, this is my own strategic reasoning. And the companion said, if that's the case, I think it's better if we camp over there and points out another spot that uh, gives a little bit better access to the wells as well as uh, a better strategic point when when in battle. And the Prophet uh, praises this and says, yeah, let's go and 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 goes uh, in that decision. So it's very important for us to see in this case, the Prophet was not just an autocrat of sorts. The Prophet was not just someone who uh, assumed power and then just said that I'm the unquestioned person. I'm the prophet of God. You have to listen to me. Being who he was and receiving the revelations that he was, he was still someone who's very human and someone who was still very open to to the consultations. We think of relating back to our time here, when we are given positions of authorities, when we are appointed to leaderships of mosques, of different Muslim communities, when uh, we are uh, when we are at these points of leadership, how we deal with issues of constructive criticism, how we deal with advice, how we deal with uh, feedback and things like that. Are we of the opinion that, oh, we're elected the leaders, we're made the leaders, so we know best, or do we uh, give deference to people regardless of their stature? You know, this Habab Ibn al-Mundir, he, he's not a particularly like, you know, elite person, but uh, the Prophet uh, takes his advice and We'll see how this pays out, but the fact that the Prophet Sallam takes this advice, gives space for this, as opposed to just being like, hey man, like, you know, I'm the prophet, who are you? Just get, get out of here. Uh, he gives that space. And so it's very significant that we see that in this example, as we build up to this battle, uh, it's not just so much about the Muslim's victory or anything like that. It's also about these small interactions and how the Muslim community and how the relationship of the Prophet is with the companions and how that transcends to us in our time. So we see as the uh, Prophet is uh, getting ready for this battle, he was anxious. He was kind of nervous. He was he was uh, he would be reported as having his arms outstretched in prayer to where other companions would be like, you know, Prophet Sallam, it's it's all right. You know, we'll be we'll be okay. You know, uh, we, we, we've we, you're you're the Prophet of God. We'll we'll, we'll do uh, we'll, we'll be fine. You know, God will take care of us. But we still see the Prophet Sallam being anxious that his arms are outstretched in prayer. A famous prayer of the Prophet Sallam that he says that brother, uh, you know, tells that you know, Allah, if, if uh, this community of yours is to be wiped out, referring to the Muslims, that there won't be another community that uh, praises you uh, or that prayer or that gives uh, prayer to you. There'll be nobody that worships you on, on earth that is left. And so you see uh, a bit of despair in this prayer. So you see the Prophet ﷺ is not just someone who uh, is, is in this moment, even uh, at the, the precipice of something so difficult, been given that type of 
assurance as someone who is having to struggle and having to collectively struggle because it's not just him it's now the lives of over 300 people that are with him that he feels responsible for so he's anxious he's naturally anxious and we see the permission in such a situation not just for anxiety and for a bit of despair but also uh, for seeing what prayer is for prayer is not for just those times of successes or just because uh, we're supposed to do it or in a sense but prayer is because you're in need and and the prophet example shows that prayer is a a conduit for us in times of need and despair to find some respite so we see on the other side of the of the fence as well uh, abu jahl also is giving a prayer he gives a very interesting prayer that turns out to you know uh, come true but it, it comes out in in not the way that he probably intended uh, abu jahl prays that our lord whichever of the two parties was less kind to their relatives and brought us what we do not know then please destroy them tomorrow uh, and so we see that uh, how, how that prayer come actually came true, but not, not again in accordance to how he would have hoped. But this battle was not just a battle of two nations. It was not just a battle of some alien cities that were not familiar with each other. This was a battle of family against family. There were fathers and sons on opposite sides. There were brothers and other brothers on other sides. There were um, you know, uncles, there were cousins, there were all these different things, these dynamics. There were neighbors, there were friends from childhood, all these different things that were uh, at play on the other side. So the battle has that uh, communal significance, the relational significance of this battle. It's not just a battle that uh, is, is, is of two, people, two entities that are not familiar with another, but we also see the religious significance. This battle takes place on Friday during Ramadan. Uh, we, we relate that back to our time when we are really struggling with, uh, with Ramadan and fasting and the conditions uh, that we sometimes have to go through, but we are mindful in this time that uh, the, the Sahaba, the uh, companions of the Prophet ﷺ were fighting uh, at this time when, uh, when, when, when they are also depleted, uh, you know, by, by terms of nourishment, uh, they are at the forefront in, in fighting for their faith and the existence of the faith. And so we see that there's a lot of different dynamics that play in Badr. So when we think about Badr, we don't just think about, oh, the, 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 the Muslims are, uh, are, you know, outmanned in a sense of a three to one disadvantage. And the battle is all about the Muslims just overcoming this and then defeating uh, a army that's three times their size. No, there's, there's so many more different uh, and more rich uh, significances to take away from this. There's so many intricacies and nuances that are within the fibers of this battle that we can take away. We see that this was no ordinary battle. This was a battle that uh, was very difficult emotionally. It was very difficult spiritually, but also just physically because of the fact that you're, you're in the month of Ramadan, you're out in the plains of uh, the, the deserts of Arabia. Uh, it's not a um, forgiving climate. So you have so many things that are going on but you also have all these other types of politics that are at play. You have all these different things that are making it a much more significant occasion than just a skirmish or battle. And so uh, we won't dwell too much on specifics of the battle. Like I said, the purpose of this, uh, this Sira uh, series here is not to just give a specific list of all these details and everything because there's so many better resources that uh, I am able to refer you to than I can ever do. Um, and many of you all may be already familiar with these resources or familiar with the story. So I don't want to repeat that. Uh, I will, I, I've referred to the syllabus that has these accounts and the PDF document that has this book. So uh, uh, Muhammad, his life based on the earliest sources by Martin Lings goes into great detail about these in a way that you can read uh, and see what all uh, happened in these in these battles, at least from from one account in that aspect. And so uh, I re really refer you to that. But we'll just go over some of the significant things that that were some takeaways from this battle for our purposes here. So we know the battle begins with a mubaraza. Uh, these mubarazas are these kind of one on ones, these duels. You've sometimes seen them in uh, other cultures and other societies and other civilizations where before the armies meet, you have the champions that come and face off you. Uh, we've probably seen it in different in different spaces. Uh, the one I can think of off the top of my head is in the movie Troy. Uh, you see this happen with Achilles and uh, another, you know, army's champion that comes out and 
uh, they, they, they fight it out, but basically as a way of um, priming the battle. Sometimes, you know, the battle can end right there that the champion uh, of one army wins and then that, that symbol, uh, symbolizes that, hey, this, this battle is done or in a sense of just uh, priming up that battle that uh, gives an indication. So in any case, however you want to interpret it, uh, the battle in the, uh, the, uh, the pre-Islamic Arab context and in the Islamic Arab context has this concept of mubariza or these one-on-ones. And so this begins, we see uh, three of the, uh, of the Muslims uh, go out, three of the uh, Meccans come out and uh, you know, the, the Meccans are defeated, but one of the Muslims is, is, uh, is martyred at that time. But uh, what will play out very interestingly is the three Meccans who were killed on that day. These were, uh, all three of them were relatives. They were, uh, and specifically they were relatives of Abu Sufyan's wife, uh, Hind. So they were her brother, her uncle, uh, and I believe uh, her father. And so uh, you see there's, there's a lot of connection that, uh, that leads into that. So there's a, a tremendous loss that occurs for her and her family. And we see that play out, especially in this concept of revenge in the Battle of Ohud, which we'll close out with today. So you see that uh, the, the battle begins with the Mubariza. The Muslims clearly take the Mubariza, but then the battle itself begins. Uh, and we see that uh, there is quite a tide um, that, that goes in the Muslims' favor. Uh, the Quran talks about it, uh, that there, there's a sort of divine intervention. Different accounts talk about uh, you know, a divine intervention of sorts of, of angels and saints in a battlefield, these people in white robes that came and uh, essentially helped turn the tide, but however you want to interpret it or understand it, uh, the Muslims who are three, uh, outnumbered three to one, were able to deliver a, a fairly significant blow to the Meccan army. So about 14 Muslims were slain that day in comparison to uh, 50 Meccans who were slain. And uh, 50, of, uh, 50 additional Meccans were taken captive. So this was a significant blow to the Meccans, again, because you're out, you're outnumbering, outmanning, outgunning like this, this other uh, contingent by three, uh, but also uh, not just in the fact that uh, the numbers that were slain, but who was slain. Uh, and we see significant elites that were taken in on the Meccan side, uh, we see Abu Jahl most prominently. Abu Jahl, the commander, uh, the one who the Prophet ﷺ had called the the Pharaoh of my Ummah, the, the the status that is given to this person in, in a sense of uh, a, a negative sense, but the the stature that this person had on the other side. You had others who were significant, like Umayya uh, ibn Khalaf. You had all these people who were the elites. Uh, you had um, the family of Hind, who were not by any means uh, just ordinary people. So you had very significant people who were uh, slain on the Meccan side uh, that dealt not just a blow in terms of numbers, but also in quality of loss. Uh, we also see that besides that, a number of very wealthy, a number of very influential people were taken as captives. Uh, it's very interesting to note here that among these captives were also people who were relatives of the Prophet ﷺ. His uncle Abbas was uh, someone who was captured. His son-in-law, Abu al-As, was uh, captured. But the Prophet ﷺ in this aspect also didn't show any deference. You know, you see him challenging these notions of tribalism. You see him challenging these notions of, uh, of kinship that, that are done at the expense of justice. So whereas certain instances may cause us to give deference to our family members, certain situations may cause us to forgive our family members when others might be wrong, but we may have a soft heart because they're our family members. The Prophet dealt with everybody equally, including those who uh, were very close to him, those who were his family members. We know Abbas uh, from our discussion about the uh, the the pledge of Aqaba was, uh, was, had gone with the Prophet ﷺ to this group of people who had come from Yathrib uh, and had stood shoulder to shoulder with the Prophet ﷺ and had uh, basically uh, stood as this person who entrusted them with his care. So the Abbas was not someone who, uh, you know, was, was just a foreign person. This Abbas was someone who was, who was very uh, trusted of the Prophet ﷺ, especially in the time when he was leaving Mecca. 
But we see very interestingly uh, this, this come out that when the captives were taken, there was a debate on their fate. So some people, some of the companions had said that they are uh, deserving of execution, that they need to be executed. Uh, they shouldn't be spared, that we should execute these, um, these, these prisoners of war. And on the other hand, you had some people like Abu Bakr who said that, no, they should be uh, spared. Perhaps it may be that uh, they may become Muslims and maybe we'll be able to get some gain from them. Uh, we may be able to uh, get some financial gain from their ransom. Uh, and we see that the, the prisoners were spared. In the end, the Prophet had opted with uh, Abu Bakr's line of reasoning that uh, the prisoners were spared. But we see the decision was criticized in the Quran that it wasn't appropriate to take the uh, a, a you know prisoners of war take captives um, in in this circumstance because uh, of not not so much because hey we we don't have forgiveness in Islam that we don't uh, you know take in any of this but because the angle of this was also perceived to be that perhaps it's not so much for the prisoners perhaps it's also for that financial gain again we're seeing that the Muslims went out and raided uh, tried to uh, were going out with the intention of raiding a caravan but met an army um, so. So it wasn't an, an, a direct intention. So maybe trying to recoup some of those losses uh, that, that were there. But uh, it was a criticism of financial gain of just aiming for things with an economic interest. Uh, but again, uh, there was a benefit nonetheless, because some of those people who were spared were very beneficial uh, later on in the history of Islam and in the community of Muslims. Uh, and, but the, and the decision was not uh, revoked. It was not that, hey, this was the wrong decision uh, and you should not do it. It was saying that, uh, you know, this was not the appropriate decision at the time, but uh, it's been all right. It's been okay. So it's not that Islam permits a wide scale un unauthorized slaughter or uh, killing of innocents in that sense, but Islam is a very holistic um, worldview in a sense, and, and, and it takes into consideration circumstances as well as intentions. And at that time, the intention that was understood to be the case for these for keeping these captives was not to be the pure intention that was seen. It was it was seen that this was seen to be more uh, something that was opportunistic and a monetary gain rather than something that was uh, to preserve the ethics and the values of Islam and of uh, the the principles of war as opposed to uh, as opposed to just you know trying to trying to get uh, earn a few bucks per se. So the captives uh, that were, were either to be released or they were to be ransomed is, is a very uh, kind of a generous way that was going about. We talk about later how um, Islam prohibits torture. Islam prohibits mutilation. So these captives were not uh, done, uh, treated in a way that was, that was, um, that was inviolable. They, they weren't treated in a way that were, uh, that, that harmed their sanctity, their, their, their human, uh, their human dignity per se. And so the captives who did not have resources to have their freedom bought uh, or to be ransomed were to teach 10 Medinans how to read and write. So the gift of literacy, the gift of knowledge was, was replaced as a way to buy their freedom. Uh, and then, like I said, there's captives who are relatives. They were treated equally. What's very interesting is that uh, you have, in this case, the Prophet's son-in-law, Abu al-As, who was his, uh, his, his daughter's his daughter Zainab's husband, um, his, uh, uh, he was captured. He was fighting on the Meccan side. He was taken as a captive. And his daughter Zainab, who was in Mecca at the time, had sent the necklace of her mother, Khadija. We talked about how the Prophet Sallam and Khadija shared a very unique and special marriage that had unfortunately come to a conclusion when Khadija had passed away um, uh, shortly after the, the, during the year of sorrow. Uh, and how the Prophet Sallam, upon receiving this necklace, had seen it had seen who it was from and recognized whose it was, was overcome, you know, had, had become pale uh, upon seeing it and had become emotionally so struck uh, and released Abu al-As on the condition that Zainab would just be sent back to him. And we see that uh, just the Prophet Sallam had not forgotten his wife. You know, we talked about how the Prophet Sallam had remarried at the time. The Prophet Sallam had remarried, uh, you know, his 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 the, the wives Soda and Aisha, but he had not forgotten Khadija. And we we talk about that consistently that he would never forget Khadija. Uh, and you know, small tokens like this, mementos like this necklace, uh, show how emotion. Was
was normative, how showing that emotion, how showing one's attachment uh, and love was something encouraged. It wasn't something that was discouraged. And so you see that he still had a very strong emotional tie to Khadija, even a few years after she had passed. And so we also see that apart from his own emotional uh, his own emotions that were taking place here, because again, it wasn't just, uh, you know, his his son-in-law that was it, that was captured. It was also his uncle. It was also other relatives of his there. And so he had to deal with the fact that, you know, these were people who are of my family, people I trusted in certain cases who had, um, you know, shown up on the wrong side. And to be able to wrestle with that, to deal with that also takes a lot of uh, emotional capacity. And so he also, this did not just re was reserved for himself. He also extended this to fellow soldiers who had experienced loss. We see that one of the companions, uh, Abu Hudayfa, uh, wept seeing his father, Utbah, uh, he wept seeing his father Utbah, uh, who was killed. He had died um, as a uh, on the Meccan side, and he had mentioned that he's not weeping because his father died, but because his father had died before he had been able to accept Islam. And so he was very overcome by this. And the Prophet ﷺ had gone and comforted him, and gone and given him uh, a shoulder. And so you see how the Prophet ﷺ was not just this warmonger, just someone who was after this. Uh, uh, this wealth or after dominance or anything like that. This was someone who was very compassionate and very sentient and uh, uh, cognizant of the needs of his army as well as the needs of others around him. Uh, so we see someone who's very much in touch with what's going on beyond the aims and the objectives. Sometimes we make it seem like a leader needs to be someone who's above all this. A leader is someone who needs to go beyond the emotions or needs to do this or that and just seal them off in one aspect. But we see how holistic the Prophet was in his governance, in his leadership, that he was someone who took advice from people who were around him. He was someone Someone who, apart from taking that advice, was someone who prayed fervently because he did not know he, even though he is the prophet of God, he still uh, was very distraught and very distressed and uh, anxious at, at what might come. So he's very much uh, trusting on God. He's an example of that tawakkul, but also he's someone who's emotional. He's someone who is very cognizant of the emotional ties uh, that not just bind um, oneself and one's relatives and past, present, and future, but also uh, loss. He's someone who is uh, who's very uh, emotional and very connected and very uh, reflective in the sense of uh, expressing his loss and expressing uh, these emotions that come with loss. So uh, we see in, in Badr, uh, the Muslims have a clear victory that manifests the, the uh, you know, they take uh, captives of the Meccan army, they uh, bury those of the Meccans um, that, that were defeated and the Meccan army, you know, flees, returns back to Mecca uh, and the return to Medina uh, is quite triumphant. They, they come back, uh, there's a celebration of Eid al-Fitr at the end of Ramadan. Um, the victory of Badr had a lot of these sentiments of feelings like the deliverance of uh, the Hebrews from Pharaoh. You see Moses' deliverance of the Hebrew from Pharaoh, and we see the parallels how the Prophet ﷺ had called Abu Jahl the Pharaoh of his ummah. So you see some of those feelings of just of deliverance, of uh, respite, of just uh, triumph, of conquer, all these things. However, there was uh, a bit of a, uh, a caveat to this because there was a somber mood that started to prevail or pervade with regards to the Prophet's daughter, Ruqayya, who he had, uh, whose, whose um, husband, uh, Uthman, he had left behind and going towards the expedition to Badr, um, his daughter Ruqayya had passed away while they were gone, had died at the age of 22. Um, and so the uh, Uthman at the time had buried uh, Ruqayya, but um, after they had returned from Badr, the Prophet and some of his family went and visited Ruqayya and you know, there was a very emotional scene that took place. So we see again, the Prophet had already lost children. We talked about how he had lost uh, you know, his, his sons um, in the time of, uh, in his marriage with Khadija. Uh, we saw how he had lost Khadija. We saw how he had lost Abu Dalib. We saw um, how he had lost these close relatives, these people who were a part of his family. Uh, we also see now he, he lost his daughter Ruqayya. So, we see that also uh, other people, we, we talked about that there were about 15 
or 14 Muslims who were slain. Uh, and we see how uh, people in, in Medina at the time who had experienced that loss uh, had begun to weep, had begun to wail uh, and begin to cry about that. And we see the Prophet interacting with some of the companions who had said that, hey, this isn't, um, this, this is wrong. Why are people like uh, wailing? That's something of pre-Islam. Um, this is, uh, you know, you shouldn't be weeping. Why are you all doing this? And you see how the Prophet uh, comforts them and, and corrects them and says that, you know, what comes from the heart and the eye are from God and his mercy. So referring to the sadness that one feels, the crying, the tears that one expresses at loss. So basically sanctifying this concept of expressing for one's loss, that it's not, you, you don't just have to bottle it up and say that, uh, okay, you know, they, they're lost, they're in a better place. Um, and especially in the sense where, where they're uh, martyrs, they're, they're being told that they are promised paradise, that they're given a uh, comfort that they haven't been given in this world. There's so much that's being given, but still the Prophet ﷺ, despite that, gives them that space to have that uh, emotion uh, and have that expression where others may feel that that's not appropriate. So you see, even in that space, even in a time where the Prophet exists, even in a time where um, he can he can say with authority that these people are uh, guaranteed paradise or gardens or whatever it may be, and give them that that actual comfort, even then he gives them the permission to, to, to give that, uh, express that sadness, because it's human nature. It's human nature, and Islam did not come to take away from those elements of human nature that have benefit for us, that are mercies from us, that there are mercies to us from God. So that's the scene in, 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 in Medina. It's, it's a bit somber, but there is a feeling of triumph that, that is there. Uh, but again, uh, there, there is that, that overwhelming emotion that's there, but again, generally positive energy that's coming out. In Mecca, on the other hand, you have shock, you have humiliation, you see there's multiple losses that have occurred. We talked about Hind, who was the wife of Abu Sufyan, who uh, had lost her uncle, her father, her brother, all in the opening duels. Um, so you see that multiple losses have occurred. Uh, there, there's a lot of trauma that has occurred to this, uh, this community and to certain individuals, but uh, there was a dream pre uh, Battle of, of, of uh, Badr in which someone had seen that uh, there was a rock that had come off the, uh, the the mountain and had gone and broken off and struck each of the homes in the Meccan Valley. So all of the homes of Mecca had been hit by this rock and it was interpreted that this was the impact of the Battle of Badr, that every home would experience some kind of loss. And uh, it's very likely that if not by a type of death, because there's over 50 deaths that had occurred, um, by some type of captives that were taken. There, there's some types of loss that people were facing. Um, and also because of the fact that it, it accounts as well for 15 of the Muslims that were that had passed away as well. There may have been in that case as well that people who had been lost on the other side that had been felt on this in this aspect as well. So we see, um, you know, this this is the scene. There's a lot of wailing. It's a very somber uh, time. Uh, there's this just uh, just complete shock, humiliation at what had just happened, a dumbfoundedness at, at what just happened because of the fact that statistically on paper, we were supposed to like uh, mop the floor with them, but you know, we just got our, our butts handed to us what, what is going on. Uh, we also see some interesting events with regards to uh, some other um, enemies of Islam that had risen to prominence because of their persecution of the Muslims uh, and they them meeting their ends. Uh, there is the death of Abu Lahab, who had not gone to the battle, who had not, uh, who had been ill at the time and so stayed home, but uh, had had uh, actually met his end um, in persecuting a slave who who had expressed joy at uh, at the Muslim's victory, uh, and he was actually struck um, uh, by Umm Fadl. Uh, um Fadl, I believe, was the wife of Abbas, um, and uh, she had struck, uh, uh, you know, Abu Lahab and said that, uh, you know, that why we, for, for hurting a slave. Um, so for hurting a slave, she had um, she had struck um, Abu Lahab and said that, you know, what, what are you what are you doing? Um, and uh, had it essentially killed him because after a few days he had uh, passed away. And so um, you see that someone like that who had who'd been uh, an elite in the Meccan society had met an end such as that uh, in, in, in that sense. And so at also we see that it's not just the fact that, hey, he got his recompense, but you see the agency of Umm Fadl. 
that uh, Umay Fadl in this aspect stood up for someone who's being persecuted, someone who is uh, a slave, someone on the margins who's being, uh, you know, being tried to being killed, being persecuted, whatever it might be. Um, and Umay Fadl stood up to the person doing the persecuting. Umay Fadl stood up to the person who was doing the harming. Uh, and she had stood up in a, man, in a manner that uh, had caused harm to the oppressor, had caused harm, and eventually over a few days had caused the death of Abu Lahab, uh, but we don't see any reprimand or anything like that for Umay Fadl uh, because of the fact she had st stood up for, for that justice. So it may seem like a kind of re re uh, a comeuppance of sorts or whatnot, but we also want to lift up how Umay Fadl, the, the people on the margins and the, the people on the side uh, carry out some of these acts of justice against those who had oppressed and Abu Lahab was one of those. Uh, uh, in the aftermath of this, because we talked about how uh, many of the elites of the Meccan society had been wiped out, uh, Abu Sufi emerges as the only viable leader for the Quraysh. Um, as I mentioned, there's disaster for Mecca. This was the news of their defeat had spread across Arabia like wildfire. Uh, there were plots to assassinate the prophet, to go and send uh, people to assassinate. And we see that these plots ended up being thwarted or those assassins would convert. So there's so many different things that are happening, but things are not going in Mecca's favor. And so uh, we see a tale of two cities, basically that, that is occurring um, at this time after Badr. In uh, Medina as well, we see that uh, apart from the fact that uh, the Muslims have come triumphant, they have, uh, you know, they, they have established themselves now as as at least a force to be reckoned with for some for some time um, now to, to be to be considered. Uh, they they are also in a community that's very different than Mecca. We talked about how Mecca was primarily uh, people who were polytheistic pre-Islamic Arabs that were there concentrated in this valley. In Medina, you have a bit of contingent of different fortresses and different um, you know hamlets that are existing. And one of these uh, and 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 a number of these hamlets belong to uh, Jewish Arab tribes and and Jewish Arab coalitions. One of these tribes uh, was the Banu Qaynuqa. Uh, the Banu Qaynuqa was probably the most militarized tribe in the oasis. They were blacksmiths, they're craftsmen, so they're people who were uh, uh, metallurgists. They're very they're they're, they're very um, you know good with uh, with crafting weapons and and things of the sort. And so uh, there were some instances of. Uh, belligerency of, of treachery um, and threats that were made to the Prophet which in, in which in a sense the Prophet had ignored. Um, there was also uh, some uh, outside uh, public incidents that occurred. There were some marketplace uh, issues that had occurred that were reported in the sense that of a Muslim woman who was harassed and you know a, a scuffle kind of going about between uh, people who were of different tribes and whatnot. So there's all these things that are going on, but uh, we see that there there is um, some underlying aspects of treachery that were occurring. That uh, there was a there's a account that the Prophet some had gone to the uh, Banu Qaynuqa and had had spoken to them and uh, you know they had basically had said that you know uh, the people you had fought they weren't really men they were just they, or they weren't really fighters they were just you know some desert uh, Arabs Bedouins things like that if you want to pick a real fight you know you, you know where to find us essentially so you have this kind of an attitude that was there um, that it was was kind of pervasive in that sense. Uh, you don't have any of them participating in in the battle. They weren't uh, obligated to, but you also see that they they kept their distance. Uh, but on the sides, they they clearly didn't want anything to do with the Muslims. And if they did, it wasn't seemed to be any good news. So. Apart from any other developments that are occurring around there, generally we're seeing this aspect of belligerency and treachery that are starting to develop. Uh, the Qaynuqa uh, are eventually, um, you know, given uh, based on their statements, based on their, uh, their you know, all these uh, developments that are occurring, they are eventually, uh, you know, surrounded and besieged in a sense. So uh, they they are, uh, you know, there's a criticism that you know Islam is anti-Semitic in a sense. So, you know the Prophet some was anti-Semitic. The Prophet some hate Jews or whatnot. Um, but we see the Prophet some time and time again uh, creating covenants, creating agreements with these different tribes, even after certain instances. So uh, he made a covenant with these folks even after the battle. Um, but we see that how these uh, were ignored, how these covenants were just kind of superficial per se uh, on on the other side, uh, and how 
the Muslims trust would be kind of under, uh, you know, just uh, underhanded by, uh, by, by these tribes. And so one of these Banu Qaynuqa, uh, what was one of them. Um, and we see eventually the process of had uh, exiled them, had uh, surrounded them, besieged them, eventually had them exiled out um, and had, uh, you know, had, had, had them, had them leave that area because of the fact that they had grown to be people who, you know, not just were speaking uh, threat, but had had the, the means to become it. So uh, when you're in Medina, when you have this city that you're building, this community that you're building, you're now um, being threatened within within the, with, uh, within your own uh, fortresses, within your own uh, city city limits. And so this was something that had to be dealt with. And uh, the Prophet had these had these folks exiled. As I mentioned, that uh, it has nothing to do with the fact that these people were Jewish or with the fact that their religion was different in any sense. Prophet Sallam has time and time again in the example and will show uh, how he has maintained uh, a, 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 a dignity with people of other faiths, with people who are respectful and of other faiths. But uh, he didn't deal with these folks any differently than he would have if they were non-Jewish and other faiths, like if they're uh, pre-Islamic uh, polytheists or anything like that, um, that there, there is a equity that is there. Sometimes that gets lost in the conveying when we just put labels on that this was a Jewish tribe. So now the process of them being a Muslim he hates Jews. This is the case, but this is not the case at all. Um, and so we see the Kainuqa were besieged. They were expelled. Uh, it was very interesting that their expulsion was uh, came at the pleas of their ally, who will come to, who's actually labeled as one of the uh, the leaders of the Munafikun, the hypocrites within the Muslim community who said that they were Muslims, but really didn't believe uh, Abdullah ibn Ubay. Uh, Abdullah ibn Ubay had come to uh, their uh, had come to their rescue per se, had begged the prophet to just leave them alone because they're his allies. And you know, the prophet some capitulated and said, okay, just uh, make sure they leave and whatnot. But you see that uh, the treachery is not just now limited to uh, people who are not Muslim, but it's, it's starting to be amongst the people who claim to be their Muslim, but uh, have just done so for political purposes. But they have a more interesting uh, more interesting interaction because of the fact that they're Muslim. And so it makes the makes the dynamic a little bit more interesting. How do you deal with the people who have claimed that they're Muslim? They come to pray, they do all these things, but they're really not with your community. And so you see the process of them having to wrestle with these folks and how the companions wrestle with the treatment of these folks for the rest of their uh, duration in Medina. And so other developments that occur in Medina, we see uh, certain people are passing away of significance. Uh, Uthman ibn Mazurun, he was uh, uh, he was a uh, ascetic. He was someone who was uh, very pious, who would take faith oftentimes a little bit to the threshold um, with fasting daily, with praying uh, on end and you know abstaining from certain things, doing all these different things and really taking on that full asceticism. Uh, and the Prophet his interactions with this person would consistently remind him of moderation, that I myself don't fast every day. I myself don't do these things. I myself uh, take these things in moderation and moderation is what's best. And so we see from Uthman ibn Mazun's, um, uh, his, his passing uh, that there is, uh, there's a lesson in that asceticism that there was space for it, but also uh, a inclination for moderation within Islam, especially from the prophet's example. It wasn't that other people were saying, hey Uthman, like chill out, the rest of us need to Get into Jannah too. The rest of us need to, you know, do, do all this stuff as well. Um, he was, uh, he was, you know, approached by the Prophet directly, who had said that, hey, um, we can be a little bit more moderate than this. You know, the faith doesn't require us to just uh, give excess in everything that we can do. It requires moderation. So, and it's what what's interesting is that uh, uh, Omar uh, had had seen on the passing of Uthman ibn Mazun. He had held this person in very high regard, uh, and when he had passed away, he was like he had held a, a feeling that hey, he had not passed away on the battlefield, so my view of him kind of diminished. But then, after seeing the Prophet ﷺ, after seeing Abu Bakr pass away and not on the battlefield, the he had said that my view of Uthman as one of those best people went back up uh, because of the fact that 
he had um, he had had this mind that you know Muslims are warriors. They should they should not be ascetics. They should pass away like this. But um, in seeing how uh, the 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 fates of the best of Muslims had come, uh, you know, Omar revised his own understanding of that. But we see in Uthman, this is not the Uthman that is Uthman ibn Affan. Uthman ibn Affan is the son-in-law of the Prophet ﷺ, the husband of Ruqayya, um, and uh, you know it, the, that Uthman. Uh, Uthman ibn Masun is another Uthman, uh, but someone who's known for his asceticism, who uh, gives us these lessons of moderation, not directly from him, but also from the uh, from the conversations the Prophet ﷺ had with him. Uh, we also see uh, other things in Medina. These, you see the community starting to develop. So we see small issues starting to be highlighted and starting to be identified. But we get an image of what's happening in Medina. The Muslims are starting to finally settle down. Things are starting to finally come about. People are having disputes. Things Life is starting to go on. People are getting married. All these different things are happening. But some important things that to, to lift up here uh, as we go into Uhud, um, that you see the... Uh, the uh, one one of the cases that, that comes up here is uh, the tree of Abu Lubaba. So Abu Lubaba um, is a companion has uh, you know has this uh, tree, this palm tree or whatnot, um, and it's it, it's an accusation is made um, by. Uh, an orphan, uh, I believe it was like a laborer, um, or so I'll just double check myself here, but you know, one, one of his, uh, his his laborers or so who's, who's an orphan um, has said that uh, Abu Lubaba has uh, taken this tree unfairly from, from him. And so Abu Lubaba uh, takes the matter, they go to the Prophet Sallallahu and Abu Lubaba is very insistent on this tree. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is like, hey man, just, you know, it's, it's probably better for you to just uh, let go of this tree, and, and Abu Lubaba is so held on to this this tree uh, that another that you know the process was like, hey, if you if you give away this tree, something better for you will 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 be there. Um, and he's like, no, this is my tree. Like you know, it's rightfully my tree. I'm not going to give away this tree. And another companion says, you know, uh, prophet, prophet of God, if I give, um, you know, if I if I'm to buy this tree, give it to this person, but uh, you know, and give it to the orphan, will I have a reward? that same reward in the province like yeah of course so that person gives an entire orchard of trees to abu lubaba um who you know of course why would you not take a bet where, or take take a trade where you have a whole field of trees as opposed to just like one tree so of course he swaps it and he gives that tree um the the other sahabi gives that tree to the orphan and uh the prophet says that that reward is with you but we see this advocacy for the orphan that the orphan in this case might not have been uh in the in the technical sense of justice right per se like when it comes to uh the the complete reparation of having that tree or the complete uh right to having that tree um or wherever whatever it might have been but it elevated another aspect of islam up that was beyond just our uh, understanding of the conventions of justice it was on the understanding of the rights of the orphan the, those in need those who do not have anything those at the margins and so the process of lifted up that generosity is above that characteristic of just giving of just being uh, st just holding on to just what you have just because it's 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 the case in this case it's an orphan you know they 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 have no property of their own they have nothing there what what is it to you just to just to give away something like that there there's more benefit in just giving that charity giving that um, as opposed to just uh, you know holding on to them just saying this is mine this is mine so small little in, uh, you know things that are coming about are happening in Mecca we see the marriage of Fatima and Ali uh, a simple wedding that takes place uh, but a joyous occasion nonetheless uh, and we see the mosque of the Prophet Sallam, not just now serving as a place that is a prayer space, but we see uh, the people of the bench, the Ahla Sufa, these people who are coming into Islam, leaving their tribes, leaving their cities, who are coming uh, and really having no wealth of their own, being people who are indigent, who are uh, needing support, uh, so people who are not uh, you know, independent financially, economically, being incorporated into the mosque, uh, a section being uh, built just for them, a bench being built, a pier being built, a covering being built right outside the Prophet ﷺ's house uh, of people who are the Ahla Sufa, the people who are um, the people of the bench who are impoverished, but who are just there to study and learn Islam and spending time with Prophet ﷺ, but don't have any economic agency essentially of their own. They are, they, it's, it's essentially he's running a shelter outside the mosque.
mosque. He's re or within the mosque. He's running this, this relief shelter for people who are refugees, for people who are impoverished, homeless, all these different things. He's, he's providing that. So we think about what our mosques are today and what the Prophet ﷺ had with his mosque then, that he was at that time, given the fact that the Muslim community was not prosperous at the time, like, you know, excessively prosperous or whatnot, people were still having to um, struggle, uh, that he basically built a relief shelter, a respite shelter within his mosque and incorporated it as part of the mosque, not just something on the outside, not just something that was away from the city, but people, when they would come to the mosque, would see people impoverished, would see people in rags, would see homeless people, would see people front and center praying with them side by side, as opposed to just on a poster that, oh, that we're, we're helping out this cause. They were there, they were centered right in that part. We also see the deference that's given. Uh, there's a story of Fatima and Ali, uh, who uh, at the time they're married, they start to settle together, but they also are now, uh, you know, they're not economically well off. And so uh, Ali and Fatima go to the Prophet I'm saying, hey, can you get us a uh, a, a, a servant or a worker or somebody to help us out, out because we're just like, we're really struggling here. And the process some reprimands them a bit. He says that, no, you know, uh, you, what you have is, is fine for you. Give instead to the Ahla Sufa, give instead to the people of the bench. They don't have anything. You know, they're living in the mosque. They're living right outside my window. Like, you know, don't uh, think about them, you know, before we ask ask anything for ourselves. So the process of not just telling people, not just doing this for himself, but he's incorporating this into the people who are closest to him, into his families. So we will go here now into Uhud, uh, but we just, want to just wanted to highlight how uh, Medina is now starting to develop. The Muslim community is starting to develop. There are growing pains, there are growths, there are all these things that are happening, but it's not just a utopia that is existing. People are uh, having interactions. People are getting to learn together, but you have a community that's being built that did not have that opportunity in Mecca. So we're now going into Uhud, uh, and we'll talk just briefly about Uhud. Uh, and inshallah, next week uh, we'll talk about um, the battle of. Uh, we'll talk the aftermath of Uhud up until the uh, trench, the battle of the trench that 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 will take place, um, uh, or Khandak. So uh, just to go briefly, um, Uhud was uh, about 16 years after the revelation, three years or so after the Hijrah or the migration. Um, we see that at during this time, the Prophet Sallam is. Uh, not just, uh, you know, it's not just settling in what, what we call here, but he's also taken on another marriage. He has become, he's gotten married to Hafsa, the daughter of Umar, a uh, companion Umar, um, but she's a widow. She, her, her husband had passed away. And so uh, this is someone who uh, he also marries, who's a widow. Um, we mentioned that uh, Aisha was the only uh, wife of his who he had married, who was unmarried before. All the other wives had been either widowed uh, in that case. And so we, we, we see that Aisha um, had that uh, element there, but we see also the Prophet was not marrying people um, just because he's a person who, of great stature. He's a, someone who is now, uh, you know, just in charge of a community and just the undisputed leader. He was somebody who was caring for the welfare of this community. And he was not just a, as, uh, you know, media often this uh, a womanizer of sorts, or people, uh, you know, may may think that he's just lust, lusting after uh, women because he has this power. But you see, the people who he is, um, uh, who he's bringing into his household, are those who are on the margins, are those who uh, have the most to lose in society because they've lost their primary support. So he's taken them on in this respect, and so we see uh, how. Um, in, in, in this respect that now as we're going up to Uhud, um, that there's certain developments, there are uh, you know, certain expeditions that are being launched. One of these expeditions, um, it, it takes a very valuable caravan um, that, that is of the Meccans. Again, you are, you've established yourself and you are now uh, starting to expand. So as, as the Muslims are uh, now settling the score, they continue to, um, to, to flex their, their might. And so you see that it's not so much now a uh, a point of view where you know the Muslims are just going to stay where they are. The Muslims uh, are going to continue to uh, you know uh, give that resistance because of the fact that they lived for over twelve years in in Mecca uh, and under that persecution, and they've only been in this place for about three or so years, and so they continue to um, to 
uh, push the envelope a bit with with the Meccans and and to, to kind of level what they had uh, what had been taken from them. So they had an expedition. That expedition was uh, they had they had taken that caravan and 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 all that had come with it. And the Quraysh have this uh, are at this crossroads that look we're going to have to do something. Like you know that this is getting out of hand because of the fact that they had taken Badr, they had uh, won at that part. It cut off uh, one of the most important trading routes to Syria. So now you had another trading route that was being jeopardized. And so now the Quraysh were essentially being pushed to the margin that they've got to now uh, act. Uh, whereas previously we see how the Meccans had, uh, you know, had, had taken advantage of, you know, their, their trade routes had become quite vaulty. Um, the Prophet ﷺ did not just, you know, preach a pacifist message. He pro preached a message uh, of justice, but also one that, uh, incorporated types of resistance, economic uh, boycotts, different strategies to level the playing field against those who had oppressed. Because the Quran tells us persecution, oppression is worse than murder uh, when coming to level that playing field. So we see that uh, the Quraysh eventually respond. They declare war. They amass an army of over 3,000 uh, people from Mecca and other other uh, kind of alliances that they have, uh, and they arrive at outside of Mecca, uh, outside of Medina, at the plains and the outside of the uh, the mountainside of Ohud. Um, and so this this you know army it has come about, uh, and then there's also a uh, back and forth decision from the Muslims to do we go out and fight? Do we stay? What do we do? Do we hold the fort? Uh, and so you have this back and forth that is taking place. And so the Muslims eventually make that decision to go out and fight um, as opposed to just staying put and holding the fort. And we see that there is um, there, there are uh, some back and forths with the with the companions that know we should stay here. We should fight in Medina. We have a very fortified city. We should do this. Uh, and then you have the decision of maybe some more rash minds that are like, no, we need to go out. We need to take the fight to them. And so uh, there are uh, numerous lessons that come in the year. But again, the Prophet had a preference. His preference was to stay in the city, to hold a, uh, to, to be sieged in a sense and to, to defend the city here. But again, uh, gave gave the agency to his companions and listened to what his companions wanted to do, even if that ended up not being what was probably the best thing to do. Uh, and so we see the Prophet Sallallahu again. He's, he's, he's only uh, increased in his uh, authority since uh, Badr uh, and, his, and, his, and, and people's uh, deference to him. Uh, and we see how the Prophet Sallallahu still at this time gives his, uh, his companions, um, that ear gives them that agency to be able to decide. Uh, we see uh, a, a number of stories that we'll, we'll talk about a little bit later, but uh, we see that uh, in, in a similar sense, going into Ohud, these weren't just people who are like, they're now Muslims, now they're going to go fight people who are not Muslims. And we sometimes paint over the humanistic elements of who's going out and fighting. Uh, there, there's occasions where there's a companion who's getting married the day before the uh, they're going to go out for battle and you know on his wedding night the the morning after his wedding night is going to go out and fight uh and will pass away we see the, the the you know we see people who whose families uh are left behind people who are 15 years old are left in uh you know left uh less than 15 years old are left for uh their families to take care of them while their fathers go out and are then slain we see all these different things happen. We see children, and not just children, but these are older 15 year olds, teenagers that uh, are uh, able bodied and going out and showing the zealousness to ready go to, to, to go fight. Um, but we also see people who uh, are, are whose hearts waver. We see people like Abdullah ibn Ubay, who had said, who had actually made the decision, who had made a the 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 opinion to stay, hold the fort because Medina has never been, uh, you know. Uh, invaded in a sense, except that people have uh, have maintained have gotten a tremendous loss because of it, um, and it's never fallen in a sense. And he and his three hundred supporters withdraw. So uh, the Muslims raised an army of about a thousand. Three hundred of them were then taken uh, and defected because they they were like, you know, this isn't really worth it. And so now you have a seven hundred man army against a three thousand man army. Um, but you have beyond the these labels of 
army, beyond these labels of soldiers, you have people that have very real ties and very significant emotional aspects um, of their lives and dimensions that we sometimes don't do justice to. We, we just talked about the newlywed. Um, think about his wife. Uh, we, there's a beautiful story where his wife kind of held on to him um and she, this is the, this was after their wedding night you know she this is uh she's holding on to him and you know asking him not to go and he, he ends up going and you know you just see the attachment you see a, a boy uh being charged by his father to take care of his sisters and his, his uh, many sisters and his mom uh and that 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 boy will never see his father again you see these really real stories that are coming out uh the process of has you know uh has a dream uh in which he he sees uh you know you know not just uh, certain aspects, but he sees that there will be some damage that comes with this wedding. Some people uh, will be, or comes with this battle, that some people will be um, uh, taken as martyrs uh, that are very close to him. And so a lot of these things are uh, sometimes pushed to the, pushed to the outsides when we don't lift up these people beyond their names or beyond just labels. Uh, and at Ohod itself, uh, it's a very famous story. We'll, we'll, we'll just real quickly in, in, a min, in a few minutes or so, just kind of wrap it up as we as we close out here. But um, we talked about at Ohod, a uh, very famous you know story of this battle, how the Prophet comes to this uh, this plain underneath the, the the mountain of Ohod, instructs 50 archers to take post up at a little kind of uh, short, smaller kind of uh, uh, a smaller kind of hill that is there tells the archers remain posted there don't uh leave even if we're uh even if we're co completely victorious or if we're dead and the vultures are picking us out um regardless of what we say stay here uh, until i give you the command to do so so these archers are posted and told not to move and not to leave their position uh until they are specifically given that order to sometimes it's also uh taken for granted the fact that there are women in this battle, specifically women like Nuseba and Ume Suleim. Um, Nuseba and Ume Suleim, Nuseba especially, um, was someone who had taken up the sword, had come with the, the, the battle, had come with the army, you know, under the guise of like, could be the nurse, will do all this medical stuff and just care for the soldiers. But she took up the sword and she started fighting. Um, and we see the Prophet Sallam did not discourage her, say, hey, no, that's a lady fighting. You put her back. Um, she's not allowed to fight. The Prophet Sallam said, no, you go, like, you know, she, she uh, may Allah bless her in a sense, like, you know, that she's, she's, uh, she's someone who was praiseworthy in that, in that moment and was someone who's closest to the process some at the time of the battle uh, and was fighting people off. And so you see that uh, we have uh, a very strong example of women in the Muslim community, not just in one sphere, but in aspects like this, where they're on the battlefield, they're literally fighting, uh, defending the Prophet ﷺ in a battle that could have easily taken his life and are putting their lives on the line, not just as people who are nurses, not just people on, on one side where we might stereotype women to be, but on the forefront there. Uh, we see other companions that, uh, you know, in defending the Prophet lose limbs, that, that are uh, fighting toe-to-toe, uh, -to -toe, but are sacrificing themselves to do so. Uh, we see a number of significant companions pass away in this battle, uh, among them the most significant uh, Hamza, the uh, uncle of the Prophet ﷺ, who was martyred in a very brutal way. Um, we see uh, not just that, we see uh, you know, as that is occurring, you know, the, bat the battle goes on, um, the people are uh, obviously being martyred, but we see the Muslims generally at this point have, are winning. They, they are pushing back the Meccans, they are taking control of the, uh, the battlefield, and at this point, the archers who are on the hill, most of them, 40 or so of them are like, hey, we are winning, like, you know, they, they're, they're running away, like, the we don't want to lose out on any of the spoils of war because we know that uh, in, in battle, once they would achieve victory or whatnot, uh, people would uh, claim the shields, claim the, the, the spoils of war, the, um, you know, the, the, the trophies and the, the armor and all this stuff. And so they feeling, seeing that they could lose out on that, they abandoned their post because they're like, all right, we're already winning. Let's just go down, abandon their post. And we, most of us know kind of what happens in a sense that, uh, Khalid ibn Walid, one of the leaders of the uh, Meccan army, comes around, uh, you know, in a sense, and pulls a pincer move on the Muslims. And so now the Muslims are fighting from the front, but now they are uh, blindsided from the back. Uh, the archers that remain on the hill are removed uh, and, and killed, uh, and the Muslims are now pinched out to where they now must go and find respite on uh, a hill and, and, and find some refuge there. The Prophet 
Salam himself is wounded very heavily. He gets hit in the teeth, his, his mouth is bleeding, he gets his cheek pierced. Uh, so many different things are happening um, that uh, he, he's going through. He has a very severe uh, wound and a set of wounds that he's experienced. So he faints a few times. Uh, some people think that he's dead. And so they make a call that the Prophet, uh, the, that Muhammad is dead um, in the Meccan camp. Uh, the Muslims are also, you know, in, in a bit of a fray. So all this stuff is kind of going on, but we see the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam also at this time still praying, still saying that, you know, how can a people like this be forgiven that, you know, and, you know, we see a, a conversation in, in, uh, in the Quran, where the where, the, where Allah says to the Prophet that uh, you know that that is not for you to say that that is for us to say. So you have this conversation kind of happening as well. So all these different things, but you see the Prophet even at this time not forgetting God, not forgetting God, um, but also in the tumult of battle, in all this stuff, you see companions who hearing that the prophet has passed away, seeing Meccans on left and right, decide to run away, decide to go get uh, safety in Medina, just run away. Uh, we don't see the prophet Sallam take any revenge on those people that, hey, you should have stayed where you were and fought to the death. No, he was understanding um, of what, what was happening. So eventually, you know, the battle starts to uh, wind down as people assume that the prophet, prophet Muhammad Sallam is dead. Uh, you know, they, 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 the Muslims start to gather on this hill. The uh, Meccans, seeing that they had come to just remove uh, uh, the Muhammadi movement, the Muhammad uh, influence, they had done that. They also withdrew a little bit, but uh, it turns out that the Prophet ﷺ was still alive. Um, and instead, as they are burying, the, the Meccans are burying their own dead, they start to go through and mutilate uh, the, the Muslims that are there. So a number of Muslims are mutilated on the field, among them the uh, the uncle of the Prophet was very viciously mutilated um, in a manner in which, you know, the Prophet on seeing the condition of the Muslims that have been mutilated, especially his uncle, vows to mutilate at least 30 of the Meccans next time he sees them in battle, but is very quickly reprimanded uh, and corrected by the Quran that uh, essentially talks about how mutilation is not befitting the Prophet. And uh, we see that. Uh, in this moment that this is a proof of the prophethood. This is a proof of the process of the prophethood because anything the process of could have said as this is uh, our way, this is what we need to do. This is what I decide. This is what Islam is. You see that tension being lifted up and put into the tradition. The Prophet in his own desire and his own uh, ways wanted to have justice and restitution for those of his Muslims who were wrongfully mutilated uh, was corrected that this is not a practice that we do to those in battle, uh, either to those who are living or to those who are dead. The battle ends up concluding with 22 Meccans dying, 70 Muslims dying, including a non-Muslim Jewish rabbi, uh, Mukhaydik, uh, what was not a Muslim. He was a Jewish rabbi who had come out and decided to fight with the Muslims because of the fact, one, of Medina, they're sharing a city because he, they had a covenant with uh, the Jewish tribes that were there. And Mukhaydik stood up when no other uh, of his tribesmen had done so. And the Prophet had called him the best of the Jews. But we see in this, in this uh, battle, oftentimes we forget those who are at the margins um, and who, who even in their, uh, in their participation, even in their, um, uh, their presence there, speak volumes. You know, there were two women that were there, but it, it speaks volumes at, as a, for, the, for the culture, for the standing of Muslim women as a whole and uh, in, in a general speaking sense. Uh, and we see in this case, the allyship of non-Muslims and this Jewish rabbi standing up there. Uh, and we see uh, as the battle winds down, the Prophet says on praise for each martyr, um, uh, has praise for the deaths of these, the, the, you know, the praise uh, over uh, these people who have, who have been killed, these husbands, these fathers, um, how he treats the companions. He doesn't treat people who deserted uh, him or who ran away or any of this stuff any differently than those who um, stayed there to the end. He, he, he doesn't uh, discriminate or anything like that. Um, and he weeps over those who are dead. He weeps over those who have passed with women, with other men, uh, and he gives that space for uh, the emotional um, expression that oftentimes is, is, is suppressed. And so as we close out today, 
we see that uh, these battles teach us not just Muslim victory or uh, defeat or you know just the black and white that battles can sometimes be, but the, the battles of early Islam were very complex. They're very uh, great. They, they, had, they had a lot of ties of family, kinship, a lot of different things that, that held the Muslim uh, community, the non-Muslim community, all these things are, are very in, uh, interrelated and very connected. And it tells us a lot about uh, the, the intricacy of uh, these events. Um, but also it shows us how beyond uh, the concept of militarism, um, that the element of leadership was not just one of success in battle or of swinging a sword or anything, but of being present, being able to take advice from other people, being uh, willing to let people on the margins lead. Uh, again, when the Prophet ﷺ had gone for Uhud, he had left uh, Abdullah ibn Abd Umm Maktoum as the person to lead the prayers, the, the blind Sahabi. So you see him uh, continuing to build up those around, uh, around him. And so we want to lift that up, not just from these battles, because these battles have their significances that you can definitely read about, but we want to definitely lift up how the leadership of the Prophet ﷺ speaks to us in our time uh, when we are given positions of leadership or when we are working with people who are in positions of leadership, how to best work with them. Uh, and we'll talk more about the lessons of these battles, inshallah, in the next session uh, and devote a little bit of time to that. But in the next session, we'll talk about the aftermath of Badr, the in-betweens up until the Battle of the Trench, inshallah. So thank you so much for watching. We'll see you all at the next uh, lesson, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.